Thank you. It's a joy to be with you. And uh, I hope this generates some creative and fascinating conversation. I'm going to start with a quote from Brother Mark Brown, who's a member of the Society of St. John the Evangelist. He says, deep gratitude and reconciliation belong to every day, not just our last. The things that would be most important to us if time were short are the very same things that ought to be important to us should the time be long. The last word I would leave with you is peace. Be at peace rather than fearful, anxious, or conflict-ridden. When angels visit, they always offer a greeting, peace be with you. Each one of us can become a heavenly messenger when we share that peace with others. And I put it to you that the end or goal of a good life is to heal and bless, to bring peace in every way we can. Peace is the end of the gospel, the aim and the goal of the good news. Peace comes through intentional decisions and actions grounded in love of ourselves, our neighbors, and our creator. Peace is created by right actions, right speech, and right living. We're not talking about right versus left, but the right as righteousness or justice. Justice that's open-handed and gracious and life-giving. The great dream of the Hebrew scriptures is something called shalom, where the lion lies down with the lamb and people study war no more, when each one has food and drink and enough abundance for an occasional feast. That dream of peace is about communities of harmony, with justice both in human relationships and with the planetary garden in which we've been planted. Justice is another word for love, a public word for love, respecting the dignity of all members of the community, structuring our social lives in ways that encourage the thriving of all its members. Justice is more than mere equality, for the more vulnerable members in society have different needs than the less vulnerable. The gospel and Paul's letters repeatedly remind us that the needy have a prior claim on the good things of God's creation. The, script, the Christian scriptures say a lot about the body and its many parts, each with particular gifts and needs. A body working together becomes more than the sum of its parts, flourishing, rejoicing, abiding in the way it was created to live. Ultimately, there can be no enduring peace unless all the members share. Holy peace comes through interdependence. The ability to respect and honor the gifts or vulnerabilities of another right. is grounded in acknowledging our own. Loving neighbor and self is essential to beginning the work of peacemaking. We can't engender peace without a measure of our own inner peace. Healing and creative responses result from being centered, from abiding in the knowledge that we are beloved simply because we are. We can't choose well or make right and just decisions without that kind of peace in our own hearts and minds. Now, I'd invite you to consider the freeways and how difficult it can be to choose safely, carefully, and considerately when we're boxed in by tailgaters, speeders, and sudden and unblinking lane changers. Peace in that kind of moment is pretty rare, but it can be cultivated mostly by slowing down. But I don't mean just getting back under the speed limit, but stepping back from our own fear and anxiety. That kind of slowing down can be encouraged by deep breaths, an inner reminder that we are beloved and acknowledging that there are other beloveds in those hurtling metal boxes. Is it easy? No, but it gets easier with practice. The work of cultivating an inner peace includes both composting the weeds of fear and undue striving and desire for retribution and fertilizing the ground of our being with love and liveliness. 
That's really what the blood of the cross and the joy of Easter are all about. Prayer, meditation, fasting, almsgiving, all the spiritual practices are focused on developing an inner peace, both spiritually and physiologically. We can't respond to a challenge thoughtful, thoughtfully and judiciously or respond out of our best and highest self without that kind of life-giving practice. Cultivating inner peace yields an ability to grow into what Abraham Lincoln called the better angels of our nature. And Howard Thurman offered the corollary. He said, yielding to fear is to be delivered to destruction. I am still struggling toward peace, toward shalom, hoping and working toward it, a peace with justice and failing frequently. This is a life's work, which is why we call it practicing our faith. We may get closer to right by the time we're dealing with last words. We live by faith that God's intention for us is the good life of healing, reconciling, and bringing something new and lively out of death and disaster and destruction. Seeking shalom begins with honoring what God has created. Each and every creature has particular gifts, abilities, and purposes. And learning to love our own particularity and that of others is central to peacemaking. I'm a very poor singer, particularly when I try to do it all by myself. But I found a measure of peace in simply doing the best I can and rejoicing abundantly in the deep and abiding choral gifts of others. To honor our own created nature is to love ourselves and to love God's creativity, even if we don't get the gifts we might have preferred. Telling the truth about our gifts and the ones we don't have makes room for honoring those of others and respecting their dignity. Jesus' baptism proclaimed that reality. When he came up from the Jordan waters, the divine word proclaimed, you are my beloved, and in you I am well pleased to dwell. The same word is proclaimed over each one of us. We're all infinitely beloved. Meditating on that truth can deepen and reaffirm an indwelling peace and begin to reduce our anxious competition with others. Peace grows in loving our neighbors as ourselves honoring their particular gifts and nurturing them without envy or attempts at appropriation. That truth is central to our present awakening search for racial reconciliation. Until we begin to honor the particular gifts of God's people and God's creatures, as the old prayer book put it, there is no health in us, but thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us miserable offenders. We are miserable when we can't see the image of God in our neighbors. And we won't find any peace until we begin to see that belovedness in neighbor and stranger. I've just finished reading a remarkable testament, the autobiography of an African-American man born in the deep south in 1893. He lived in Sewanee, which is in Tennessee, and it's the site of an Episcopal college. He later lived in Texas, and he spent his last decades in California, where he died in 1968. He was the son of an African-American woman and a white aristocrat who never acknowledged his son. Ely Green was reared under Jim Crow, and in spite of the insults and provocations of others, lived a life of remarkable peacemaking. Ely made it his life's work to remove the word Negro from the American language, assist, insisting that that word was the description of a slave, not a free black man. Mr. Green was beaten, ostracized, jailed, punished, paid less than white men, and yet he kept standing up for others. He risked his own life repeatedly 
to defend fellow black soldiers in France during World War I, to rescue black school teachers from white lawmen trying to rape them, and to integrate a California aircraft plant during World War II. Ely Green was a man of eternal hope, but not wishful thinking. He had a deep and abiding inner peace, a yearning for justice, and a willingness to spend his life for the cause of justice. His witness preceded the civil rights movement of the 60s and his nonviolence anticipated Martin Luther King's. His ability to confront the absence of peace drove him to seek it everywhere. His youth in Sewanee gave him twin opportunities to learn the healing gifts of the forest and its plants and to question the discrimination and segregation around him. Seeking shalom begins with honoring what God has created. Loving our neighbors includes cherishing the earth from which all life on this planet was created. The state of this planet urgently, urgently calls for reconciliation with our human and non-human neighbors. Learning to honor the first residents the traditional indigenous land stewards of each place is part of that reconciling work. Later arrivals are learning that the ability of the first peoples to cherish their environment can bring healing for all. The lands and creatures around us were created for abundance and creativity to support the life of the whole community. They weren't created for wanton selfish exploitation. Indigenous peoples traditionally lived with a deep understanding of the interconnectedness of life and living systems, a sense that's key to our biblical tradition if we look at it carefully, in spite of our sinful urges to exploit and deface those living systems. I would invite you in this season to seek the image of your creator in the face of a stranger. Acknowledge the miraculous gifts of every creature, amoeba, bacillus, carrot, dog, elephant, fish, octopus, paramecium, quetzal, rhino, sparrow. God cares for each and every one. Our creation stories challenge us to tend and cherish the garden's fields, it's beasts and birds, fish and fowl. God created them all and God said, be fruitful. In other words, be creative as God is created for we are made in that divine creative image. Become a steward of land and sea, of river, marsh and fen, of beach and reef and canyon, all of them beset by human trash. Where do the plastic bags and cigarette butts and beer bottles go? What about the runoff from mining tailings and pharmaceutical manufacturing? Traces can be found in the bodies of our unborn children, as well as seagull chicks. Fishing nets extended for miles at sea drift and trap and kill birds and turtles, whales and dolphins and every kind of fish. Lost nets like that eventually sink together with their dead and dying cargo. Peace comes with careful stewarding of each part of our lives. Can we be more conscious of our use and misuse of water, of the food we consume, how we care for our bodies and those of the animals and people around us? Can we become people of blessing? Blessing the lives and gifts of each creature on this planet, treading lightly on this fragile earth, our island home, walking softly in the garden's evening breeze at peace with creator and the world around us. There's an old Irish blessing that says, 
peace between neighbors, peace between kindred, peace between lovers in love of the king of life, peace between person and person, peace between wife and husband, peace between women and children, the peace of Christ above all peace. Bless, O Christ, my face. Let my face bless everything. Bless, O Christ, mine eye. Let mine eye bless all it sees. Where and how might we bless? What about that open road filled with those large metal boxes directed by anonymous hands? The next time one of them cuts us off, can we bless rather than curse? Somehow a full five-fingered blessing just might disarm the other driver and remind us and renew a right spirit within us both. Much of the world's disequilibrium, in other words, grief and suffering, lies in unequal concern for self and neighbor. That disequilibrium is part of our created nature, for we are made to look out for number one. And we are created for love, to cherish other creatures near to us. The eternal challenge is to live in that both and, and at the creative fulcrum, expose our yearning for communion with others, our yearning for mutuality, and for creating new and more abundant life. Creativity requires vulnerability as well as curiosity. Vulnerability means openness and curiosity about what is and what might be. It's key to loving mutual relationships with other human beings and all creation. When we acknowledge and respect another person's particularity, we begin to participate in something new, new relationships, new possibilities. That kind of creativity is fueled by courage, literally our heart and life stuff. I started by talking about peace and reconciliation. Courage and creativity are part of that work. For many people, Bayard Rustin is less well known than Martin Luther King Jr. Yet Rustin was his prophet and teacher, encouraging nonviolence in the search for racial equity in this land. Under Rustin's tutelage, King relinquished his armed guards and his guns. He lived less protected and became more able to accompany the vulnerable. The great lovers of this world, the deep lovers of God's creation and creatures become friends who look carefully and inquisitively. We know something of this in our intimate human relationships as we tend the vulnerabilities and wounds of loved ones as well as their particular gifts. To love is to bless the complexity of each being, honoring even the bee's sting and the spider's venom. To love is to acknowledge our own violent reactions and seek life-giving responses. As Mary Oliver said, what will you do with your one wild and precious life? What if you knew your own death were very near? I may not know when or how that moment will come, but my instinct is to bless what I can and to go in peace. I'm still working at re reconciling with relatives, with friends and strangers, with those who continues to suffer our racist society and its structures, with grief over the state of this planet, Reconciling starts with taking counsel together. That's literally what it means. Approaching others with curiosity, listening deeply, seeking healing. It continues with reaching beyond what divides and seeking the image of God in the people who most annoy and frustrate me, looking deeper within myself. Reconciliation begins to live as people sit down together in peace where the stuff of life is shared in abundance, 
food and farmland and friendship and celebration and the water of life, whether it comes from a clear cold stream or an Irish whiskey. We have remarkable images of that healed living community in Isaiah's banquet on the hillside with rich foods and well-aged wines and an end to threats and war. In Micah's vision, where people transform weapons into farm implements, where they learn war no more and sit in peace under their vines and fig trees and no one lives in fear. We get tastes in this life. And I believe the noblest work of all is to put flesh on those bones yearning for peace. I want to live with the urgency of the kind Edna St. Vincent Millay spoke of. I burn my candle at both ends. It will not last the night. But ah, my foes and oh, my friends, it gives a lovely light. For me, it's a hope that I might be used to the full and be ready to go gently into that good night, unraging because I've given what I could. In love, encouragement, honor, and blessing. And while I still walk this earthly road to reach beyond what I think is possible. Peace be with you. Deep peace of the running wave to you, deep peace of the flowing air to you, deep peace of the quiet earth to you, deep peace of the shining stars to you, deep peace of the gentle night to you, moon and stars pour their healing light on you, deep peace of the sun of peace to you.